Hello, Sitzwe here again, and welcome to episode four of Redstone Basics. Uh, today we're going to be looking at clocks. Now, I'll just reiterate what was mentioned in episode three before this. Um, I had originally recorded this entire place, uh, which you can see on the map there. Um, but it had weighed in at 45 minutes of solid information, so I am doing some shorter episodes for you back to back. And there'll be a couple more episodes after this on this particular area. So, we're doing clocks. Now, a clock, as you're probably aware in the real world, is something that keeps time. But it can also be used so that something happens at a specific point in time. So, say your lunchtime is at 12. Every day you look at your clock, clock says 12, that commands you to go off and have lunch, uh, effectively. Uh, clocks work in a similar sort of way for redstone stuff. In a more simple form, I have one actually set up here that looks actually a bit like a clock. Um, let's extend them out a little. And you can manually activate these. So if I just send a signal in, you notice every time it gets to our 9 o'clock position, it's activating the output. Now we've gone ahead and knackered it there. Let's uh, reset that again. Actually, the, the speed can't be altered until you uh, sort of mess something up. But with manual alteration, that's one of the problems. You leave your input on too long, you can do that and lock it out. And the only way to reset it is by hand. But they can be used in circuits uh, for sort of a one off thing easily enough. There are more entertaining types of clocks though. This little one is actually only possible now in the latest update um, of 1.5. This is the Hopper Toggle Clock. Now if you just have a look in here, I have a nice little wooden button. And if you just see there, you've got the little bits that pass them into the next one. So this one is actually set to go there, that one goes there, that one goes there. And this switch is just the toggle part because it locks this off by supplying it with power. Now every time our item comes into this one, our comparator, which as you may know can read the contents of uh, things like hoppers and other containers, gives us an output and comes out there. So if you just turn that on, there you go. And as it's toggle, I can turn it back off again. So that's a bit more reliable than these, obviously. Can be a bit less laggy as well. Um, the updates of those can upset multiplayer servers quite easily. Now this one is uh, a reasonably accurate, it's not 100% accurate, but reasonably accurate long clock. Um, the cobweb, a minecart takes, I think, it's about 30 seconds or something to fall through it. And the more of them you add, the more it takes there. So I'll just demonstrate how these little minecart cobweb clocks work. So this is our little track sensor here, so for output. And if we activate it, output goes off. Cart comes up and falls in the cobweb or line of cobwebs. And then you just wait and it slowly works its way through. And it says, I don't know, 30 seconds or something. And then it'll fall back down, land on there, go around and set off the output again. And as I said, there's really no limit to how tall a tower of cobwebs you make. So that's a fairly compact. Uh, oh, it's about to go. That's fairly compact in regards to a long timer. First time I see these, I think uh, Seth Bling had them set up to keep time always as day and hooked up to command block. Now, thanks to daylight sensors, that use is not really all that practical anymore. But they're still good as a long timer though. And it's easy enough to turn it off and when it lands it won't move. Now, a couple other little types of clocks. This one's uh, one that you may find yourself using a lot. It's uh, the V repeater clock. Now, you may remember from uh, previous episodes, I said if you have a torch and it runs into a block and you have redstone dust here, it powers itself round and round and will burn out. If you extend the assembly, however, so you've got the dust over here, and we have this repeater delaying the signal before it powers itself, you actually get a clock that goes on and off. So if we just uh, cut power off here, 
and now it loops around itself like that. That's uh, nice, and then just turn the power on there, locks that out by supplying it with power, and it stops again. And I seem to have left the block up. There we go. So that's uh, a handy compact clock. You can, if you want, even put the switch um, there um, or there. I think it even works there. Um, so you don't even need this block over here. So that's uh, quite a tiny little clock that's uh, reliable. You could also um, put a bit more wiring in and continue the loop of it, but it starts getting a bit unwieldy then. But there are loads of uh, other clock designs, but there's a couple of unusual ones um, that rely on these comparators. And they're known as fader clocks. So I'll explain how they work in a second. This relies on uh, the sort of analog power. So this one is a nine pulse. So that means it's on for one tick and it's off for eight ticks. So I'm just gonna turn the switch off so that it's no longer locked. And if you watch, as you can see the dust, uh, the power level keeps dropping and that's giving us a one tick output, allowing us to do that. The principle of how it works, this is our loop here and then this is our output. So this comparator, say, um, well, we'll start with the torch. So this torch lights up and gives 15 power into this block. So it's 15 there, powers this, so 15 goes into this. Our 15 power comes out the front, powering this block, and that goes through 14, 13 power, 13 in the back, and then it goes 13, 12, 11, and round it goes until the power drops off and it's going to activate. Obviously, the moment it activates, it then turns itself off again due to the powering itself there. And that's what gives us your one tick. So that's uh, a useful little thing as well. There we go. Now there's a slightly more extended version, and this is a 29 pulser. So that's on for two redstone ticks and off for 27. So I'll turn it on and then just show how it works. So you see our torch blinks on, so on for two ticks, so it doesn't leave the block behind. But what's happening here is that this 15 power there is going there, turning 14, and at the back of that comes out as 14, that's 13. 13 goes in there, out there, so it's still 13, and it loses another one there. And that slowly goes down until there's nothing goes in here, and that can go on. So that relies on the fading of analog power. So that's uh, quite a nice way of making something happen not that often. but Still not use a lot of space. I'm going to show you some more in regards to these later episode. Um, so I'm not going to go too much more into that just now. Now the final clock thing that we have in this episode is known as a subtraction pulser. Now if you've seen the videos I've done on the uh, dropper towers, the designer came up with actually ended up using these and before they actually had a name. So this one is on for one tick and off for one tick. That's why it's a pulser. And it works on the principle of the subtraction mode, which means we've got that up, as you can see. So if we supply 15 power in here, 15 comes out the front. So obviously that goes up. Now that 15 power here, that goes there, comes 14, that goes there, becomes 13. So the 13 is subtracted off the 15 coming out the front which leaves two. And that is your two, that's your one, so now there's zero and it becomes unpowered. That also means that the power going in the side here is no longer enough to stop that. So on the next pulse, it goes back out again. So if you see the rapid flickering on and off, that's how it's doing it. And we're getting one tick pulses out of it, and we get that. I'd recommend not leaving stuff like this running on a server um, all that often because it will lag the hell out of stuff. In fact, if I just pull up here, I'm getting a frame rate there of, what, about 70. And if I turn it off, 
There we go. It's uh, gone up to 1995 in this area. But there you go. So that's uh, clocks. In the next episode, we're actually going to look at latches. So that'll be uh, episode five. But yeah, so that's it for this episode. Um, as I forgot to mention in the third episode, this entire area is going to be in a downloadable world file that will be in description of all of these videos. And the description of the previous videos will all be updated with it as well. So anyway, uh, I shall see you next episode. Uh, thanks for watching and bye-bye.